created live on Fireside. The following program was recorded live on Fireside Chat. If you'd like to participate in these chats, join us every Thursday at noon Eastern Time at firesidechat.com slash Scott Monty. Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advance him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? John Adams said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of the fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership. Principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the first century. This is Timeless Leadership. Well, hello there, and welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we explore the principles and virtues that accompany successful and admirable leaders. I'm Scott Monty, and if you aren't yet subscribed to the Timeless and Timely Newsletter and the Timeless Leadership Podcast, where we regularly talk about these topics, please do so at TimelessTimely.com. And if you haven't yet given us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, I'd appreciate you doing that. It helps other people find the show and find inspiring leadership tips. Today, we're together exploring control. You know, every day there seems like there's something in our lives that's spiraling out of control. Whether it's a weather situation that's knocking out power, a political figure that's creating some online ruckus, or our company's stock is tanking. In situations like these, you tend to feel powerless, powerless to control anything. And it's true. I mean, you can't control the weather. You can't control what some fool congressional whack job is saying, and you certainly can't control the stock market. Well, unless you're Elon Musk and it's Bitcoin, but that's an entire other story. What you can control is your reaction. You determine what will rile you up, what will touch a nerve, what will knock you off of your game. And you also determine what won't. And that's what's within your control. Carrie Lorenz was one of the first female F-14 Tomcat fighter pilots in the U.S. Navy. As if that's not harrowing enough, she's also a mom, wife, business consultant, global speaker, and a Wall Street Journal best-selling author. Suffice it to say that Carrie knows that the stress we experience every day can be just as intense as the stress in the cockpit of a fighter jet going Mach 2. But she's got a secret weapon to prevail. Years of training to overcome the specific natures of uncertainty, stress, burnout, anxiety, and pressure. In her first book, Fearless Leadership, High Performance Lessons from the Flight Deck, Carrie Lorenz helped us understand the fundamentals of winning under pressure, reducing errors, and overcoming obstacles. Now, in Span of Control, she walks us through the fundamentals of surviving and succeeding during times of crisis. Weaving together eye-opening science, gripping personal stories, insightful interviews, prescriptive advice, and, of course, a high-octane dose of encouragement and practicality, Carrie helps leaders recognize how to focus on what matters most, formulate a plan for success, and communicate what's possible. Carrie, welcome to Timeless Leadership. 
Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Excellent. So I, I want to go back in time with you, if I can. When, when did you first get into a cockpit? Oh, gosh. Uh, years ago? Uh, I actually didn't have any flight time before I started flight training in the Navy. You're so, kidding. No, I know. It is kind of crazy. There, There's always a handful of people that show up uh, at flight school, either coming out of the Naval Academy or uh, if you've gone through an ROTC program or do what I did, where I was a regular college graduate and then went through the Navy 16-week aviation officer candidate program. And there will be a, a, a cohort of people that will show up maybe as certified flight instructors, or maybe they have a couple of hundred hours of flight time. And then there are those of us who just know we want to fly and are right out of the gate, just having to work hard, drink from the fire hose, and try to figure it all out. Um, but it's it's a pretty fascinating process That's for it. some of those yeah, for some of those people who do have a lot of flight time, obviously right out of the gate, mm-hmm. it's easier um, <laughs> because they know which way is up and which way is down and how to fly an airplane and read the instruments. But the process of training and, again, that drinking from the fire hose, if you don't learn how to focus and how to consume large amounts of information and make good decisions quickly, eventually that nets out over time. Mm-hmm. Um or the people who don't or haven't picked up on that skill set because they already know how to fly, it'll Mm. end up catching up to them. So, yeah, first out of the gate. Wow. Navy, a Navy aircraft, so (laughs) good times. (laughs) So, I mean, that's interesting. So when did you know that you wanted to be a fighter pilot? Well, I, you know, I didn't have an aha moment. I grew up in a family uh, that was uh, dedicated to service. I've got lots of family members that have served across every service. So within the Army, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, and in all different positions, you know, over the last 50, 60 years, actually. But my dad was actually a Marine Corps pilot. And I've got a brother who's just a year older than me. And so he and I grew up um, playing with, uh, you know, his silk maps and and flight suits and helmets and all of that. And we'd flip over the bar stools and we'd hop in between the little, you know, the little braces. And and one of us would be in the front of the cockpit, you know, air quotes cockpit. And the other one would be behind as we were pretending like we were flying airplanes. But I knew I wanted to fly, but I also didn't really see a path forward in it because there were very few women that flew. Mm. And it wasn't until uh, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and just about an hour and a half south of there is actually Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where one of the world's biggest air shows happens every year. And I think I was about 11 years old. And, you know, my dad would take us down to that every year. And that's lots of old airplanes and experimental airplanes and the Thunderbirds would show up every other year and then it would be the blue angels and, you know, all sorts of cool, cool things happening. But I actually had the the good fortune of running across and being introduced to a wasp, one of our women air force service pilots. And of course, you know, when I was 11 to me, she seemed really old because she was probably, you know, 50 years old. (laughs) Golly. That's very unrelatable when you're 11. Um, And, you know, she was just encouraging and I thought it was a cool story. But yet I didn't see any real examples of women out there. And obviously there was no social media during that time. So it was just sort of something that I kept to myself. And on the occasion that I would mention to other people outside of maybe my mom or dad that I wanted to fly, there was always pushback. It was always, why, why would you want to do that? Girls don't do that. Or that sounds really hard. You know, maybe you should be a flight attendant. So, Ooh, you know, I, which is nothing wrong with that. My mom was a stewardess for Eastern Airlines um, for several years until she got married. So obviously it's, a, it's an important position. But when you tell somebody you want to fly and the, the quick answer is, oh, that's too hard. Don't do that you tend to not share that dream with many people. So I think it was always part of, you know, it was in my blood. It was something that I wanted to do, but not, 
not that I was so all in that that was all I was focused on. Did you right? share that with your dad? I well, I did. My dad was always different than maybe an experience that other people have had with with their parents or or you know maybe even a mentor in their life. My dad was always super low key and never pushed either my brother or I to do any certain thing. Uh, if we said we wanted to do something, he was supportive. And he would just say, well, be ready to work hard. A low key he, Marine. I don't know if I've ever heard of one of those before. I know. Well, <laughs> and it was, it was fascinating because he, you know, we would meet his friends and people would always come in for during the summer, during that, um, the time of the air show. So after, usually after they'd had a couple of cocktails, you know, the hands start moving, the stories start getting really big. Their, their daring feats of heroism, I'm sure always increase over the years. <laughs> um, but you'd always kind of like try to keep a really low profile. And uh, my dad was just like, you know, I think you would like it because, and his group of friends were very driven, very kind and also very humble. Mm. So it wasn't this big showy, look at me, look how awesome I am. Tell me how awesome I am. It was kind of a head nod. And with, with his group and where he came from, there was such a strong work ethic mm. with all of them that they, and they also were a little bit older and they had, you know, had all experienced loss in their lives as well mm. that I think they were, savvy enough or had enough understanding or empathy that if you were to push somebody or guilt somebody into choosing that path, that there, there's a chance that something might happen. And the guilt that would come to that, if you push somebody hard in a direction could be unsurvivable. Mm. So for all of them, I think it was, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, we'll support you be ready to work hard, not you need to do this. And I think that's, that's an important distinction mm. to make. Um, certainly for parents yeah. to understand what the load that comes with that. If you push your, your kids in that direction. Mm. Well, and interestingly enough, I think what you're, you're talking about there as a parent, you know, I mean, this, this comes within our span of control as parents, you know, I mean, you, you can only set your kids up for uh, certain things. You can't control their entire lives. You can, you can prepare them. Uh, you can offer them advice. Uh, you can open them up to opportunities, but ultimately they're going to go a direction they choose. And you need, you need to be okay with that at a certain point. Yeah, I think so. And as you know, as you mentioned in the intro, I'm a mom, I've got four kids and not to, you know, not to devolve into necessarily an entire parenting conversation, although we could, we could definitely do that. You know, I think also, though, setting your kids up for success, it, the, a big piece of that is making sure that you've instilled in them the value of work mm. and being able to be committed to a process, be committed to the journey and not just solely focused on the outcome. And that when you also are doing that, that what, what's super important is to also give them the skills, and it is a skill, to be able to set aside what's not as important, but also build resiliency within them. Mm. So that when things go wrong, and you know, they will, <laughs> and, and sometimes it can be catastrophic and yeah. things that aren't, air quotes, fair or are unseen that how do you, how do you not only move through that, but how do you bounce back from that so that you're stronger for having had that happen than if it hadn't happened. And this is not in the um, social media, Instagram butterflies and unicorns of, Oh, don't worry. Hard times make for hard people type of thing. Um, but that you can see value in it and that you, you've equipped your kids or if we look at it from a business perspective, your team, your teammates with the ability to learn from something and keep taking that next step. So yeah. I think certainly I found, um, 
you know, going through that flight school journey, going through the officer, uh, aviation officer candidate school and everything else thereafter is that it's having that ability to dip in and out of what maybe that dream is, what that vision is, and then know and expect that there will be setbacks along the way. Um, and that not to become so overwhelmed by looking so far around the corner that it crushes you, mm. right? Yeah. That some days, some days you and whether you have toddlers, whether you have teenagers, whether you have no kids, and it's you feeling like you're against the world right now. Some days you just have to be able to look at your watch and go, I can make it till the top of the hour. Right? Yeah, that, that's that's exactly <laughs> right. You know, how you show up in the next five minutes probably matters more than uh, than anything else at certain points. Yeah, for sure. And again, that's, that's having, that's building the ability to be resilient, to mm-hmm. stay focused in the present without being a narcissist um, while you still are looking at where is it that you want to go. That's not just aspirational, but that allows you to, to, again, stay grounded right now and not be overwhelmed by the distractions, yeah. which I see happening so much to people right now. And it, it has devastating effects on relationships, on jobs, on everything. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to jump into that with you in just a moment. If you're just joining us, we are here with Carrie Lorenz, who was one of the first female F-14 Tomcat fighter pilots in the U.S. Navy. And she is also the author of Span of Control. And that's what we're talking about here today is uh, control, letting go of it, embracing it, and understanding uh, where it can affect us. If, um, if if you also heard Carrie mention resilience there, that's interesting because a few shows ago we did a show on resilience. We talked with Kat Cole. So if you want to go back in the podcast mm-hmm. archives and look for that, uh, you can listen to our interview with Kat. So Carrie, you open your book, Chapter 1, obviously talking a bit about your, your uh, cockpit experience, but there was another a set of harrowing experiences that actually caused you some health concerns and to question how you were handling things between work and home and being on the road and trying to manage everything. Can you take us through that experience and, and what you came to realize out of it? Sure. And just, just as a level set, this, you know, part of this is, is people, you know, who have joined us are, can probably imagine. Um, when I write, I'm not writing Vegas tell-alls. And certainly, <laughs> as a former fighter pilot, sharing vulnerabilities can be challenging. Um, but I think that, that that piece of it and what you're referring to is when I was um, a, a new mom of my fourth child, I ended up having, we, my husband and I, four kids under the age of seven, um, which was a bit of a handful, (laughs) right? Um, And we had just moved to a new town and we were a different state. We we moved down to the Mid-South, no family, no friends. My husband's job took him away about half of the month, uh, every month. And I was like, I've got this. I can, I can do all the things. I'm trying to run a business. I'm on the PTA showing up with my youngest two kids in a double stroller, you know, just juggling all of the things. And at the same time, just after we moved down there, uh, I ended up finding out um, both of my kids ended up having to have a pretty specialized and different surgeries. My dad was in an accident back up home, a snowmobiling accident. And yet my husband was out of town. He was critically injured. My kids have to have surgery. I'm trying to run my business. And I thought I was handling everything, right? And for me, I'm, I'm of direct Dutch and Hungarian immigrant descent. We're stoic people. Like we don't complain. We just grind. We just show up. We do the work. We don't bring a lot of drama to it. We keep our poker face on. And we just keep going. And yet what started happening was I would get these errant episodes where I felt like I was going to pass out or I felt like I'm having a heart attack. Something's happening to me and I'm not prone to drama. I'm not like, I mean, I'm pretty, I work hard, but I'm not super excitable. 
And I ended up having to go to several cardiologists and they had me wear what's called a halter monitor. So you strap on electrodes and I had to wear this monitor on my chest for 30 days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it fed them data nonstop. And what they found out was at certain pressure points during the day, uh, trying to load all of my kids into four individual Britax car seats, trying to get to PTA meetings on time, trying to get my kids down for naps or at bedtime, my heart was racing between about 170 and some days 180 beats a minute, wow. which if you've worked out before, <laughs> that's that's like a full on effort, right? Even if you're 22 years old, that's that's like max, that's hill climbing on your on your bike, right? Or on your cardio machine. And it was, it was, what it was, was it was essentially, um, it was called stress induced cardiomyopathy that my body was internalizing all this stress and was throwing all of its resources into just handling getting through that moment. And it's the weirdest thing because it's not like I wasn't, I loved being a mom. Again, I'm not generally an excitable person, not to be confused with exciting. Um, I don't, right. I don't excite easily or get scared easily. And yet I was trying to manage all of these things. And it's, it's also called broken heart syndrome. So Mm -hmm. sometimes that happens to people who have a really extreme stress response that mimics a heart attack or an anxiety attack, but I wasn't actually having panic attacks or anxiety attacks my body was just scientifically processing all that stress in a way that looked like that. So I had to figure out, okay, if I don't get my act together somehow, I'm not going to be here because this is, these are for a month. And that was after I sought help that the, the wearing the halter monitor that I had to figure out a different way of doing business or the next time it happens it's going to be for real. So I got sucked into the belief or the trap that women are better multitaskers. I can handle all the things. I've flown at twice the speed of sound at night, upside down, super, super terrifying environments. I'm a mom. Like, how hard can this be? I can do this. And I I mean, it's not, I wasn't deployed. I wasn't in theater. I didn't actually just lose my partner. Like, how, this is crazy. So, but what I, what I had to do and what I, what became a harsh reality for me is that everyone struggles, no matter how high performing you think you are, and you have to be able to find that path forward. So I took that awareness, if you will, and, and discovering that something was actually happening and I had to flip it into doing something about it. I had to flip it into action. So I went back to the basics. I went back to the things that used to work for me effectively, flying a high-speed fighter and and managing lots of moving pieces and parts. Mm -hmm. I ended up taking a hot second to identify the absolute most important things and writing it down, right? Putting it on paper so my brain's not having to do the work of remembering it, that mental load, right? I would write down quick little checklists. I started asking my neighbors for, you know, who do you recommend as a babysitter? I have to take my kids to doctor's appointments for two and a half hours, and I don't want to have to bring all four of them to a waiting room every time. So, and and it's not that all of a sudden come that next Monday, everything was solved, but quickly and gradually things started getting much better. Mm. And it gave me a little bit of margin back Mm -hmm. and it gave me the capacity back to start being able to be a little more thoughtful or even make better decisions. And quite frankly, um, you know, we put our house on the market at the same time. And I know this is a really long response to your answer, but as a parent, I had to start letting things go Mm. and having grown up in a household (laughs) from as a Marine, as a dad, where 15 minutes early is on time, on time is late, and late is unacceptable. I had to go with, you know what, when when, you're, when your daughter or your son throws up on themselves in their car seat, you're about to be late. And that's it. That's life. And 
I started letting some of that stuff go. Not that I just said, screw it. And, you know, fed everything to the wolves, but you know, I'm like, it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm literally juggling four kids and a business here. Things don't have to be perfect. Everybody needs to be fed, watered, healthy, and read to. But if the laundry sits on the kitchen table for an extra day or two, well, it's clean. We've got clothes, (laughs) right? Uh, Let it go, fam. Let it go. So, yeah, so that was, and, and part of that then started being, becoming much more reflective, I think, even in, in the work that I was doing and that allowing for that space of don't wait to launch things until they're perfect. Don't, you know, give your clients, give the people you're working with, give your teammates the space of, hey, we're just here to harness what's possible and what's possible doesn't mean it needs to be perfect. Mm. As long as we're talking to each other and we're learning and we're setting our egos aside, like, let's enjoy the ride here. Yeah. Well, I know we've got some uh, people interested in asking questions, and we'll get to you in just a moment. But, I, you know, Carrie, I want to follow up on this, um, th- this, this thread you just uh, kind of unraveled here. Do you think that living in the time we do now – where you look across, say, uh, people's Instagram feeds, and it seems like they're living a life of perfection. You think that works against us in trying to capture some of this this control in our lives? So, full disclaimer: <clears throat> I love Instagram. I love scrolling stories because stories are generally the most unfiltered piece. I.e somebody's running with their dog or it's a live shot of them at the trail or behind the scenes. I have no doubt in my military mind and my mom mind and my person mind that what we are seeing on social media is going to be one of the most damaging mental health things that will, I think it's going to be a huge inflection point that 50 years from now, people are going to look back at it and go, Yeah. Why did we let that happen? Mm. It should be indicative that the overwhelming majority of executives and uh, people who work at social media companies don't let their kids have it on their phones. And there's no way it can't be when every picture you see or the majority of pictures are somebody whose face has been filtered, whose waist has been snatched, who's on their dream stage and best business team ever. There's no way as people, our brains don't lock on to, I'm not enough. My team's not enough. I'm never going to be able to catch up. I feel less than. And then that has a profound effect on, I think, how almost every one of us then shows up. How we show up for our families, how we show up for the businesses we're in or we lead or are a part of. But again, I like Instagram stories I think that there are conversations about social media, clearly, but if you haven't watched your kids or your friend's kids face become crestfallen when they realize they're not at a party because they're, they're sitting there scrolling on TikTok, um, it's boy, this is, we have a tough needle to thread, uh, so I don't want to. I don't want to be a hypocrite and say, "Oh, all social media is, is awful." Get off my lawn, um, because I love pieces of it and I love some of the connection. But holy cats, there's yeah. so much that's so extremely filtered, and it's so well done you don't even realize it's filtered. That then that changes us all psychologically. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you there. And I, I think that's a wonderful insight about Instagram stories. I hadn't thought of it that way before, but the way you explain it, I, I think it's uh, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, what's interesting, too, is uh, in as much as the world has been uh, topsy-turvy for the last year and a half during the pandemic, um, in some ways it's actually been – a, a great equalizer that, you know, suddenly we're seeing people being more transparent, being more vulnerable, being in some cases more empathetic with uh, their, their fellow humans. Um, you know, so there's, there's pluses and minuses, but on balance, I think, you know, when we're in quote unquote normal times, I think what you've outlined there 
is uh, something to be aware of and something that could be extremely uh, damaging long term. Yeah, I sure hope so. I know I went from doing about 100 to 110 keynotes uh, pre-pandemic on the road to now everything is flipped virtual. And for my events that are live, every time right out of the gate, because some of them are pre-records as well, uh, mm-hmm. or you'll hop into a live a live chat, I always tell people, I, I try to do a level set and I'm like, hey, I know we're all here together. Obviously, I'm in my office. I'm not at the road. If your kids come in, if your, you know, your cat shows up or your dog barks, show me your pets, <laughs> right? Show me your cats. And, and or even meeting invites, I'm like, you don't have to be on video. Yeah. I don't get show pony ready for me. You don't, this does not have to be on video. So because it is exhausting, I know I, and I'll, I'll try to make this piece really short at, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic last year and up through about two months ago, all of my kids were now suddenly going to school at home, which meant I had four kids Mm. in four different programs on different platforms every day, whether, whether it was Google Hangouts or some Schoology or, or Zoom or whatever, all competing for quiet, for bandwidth, for everything. And I'm sensitive to the fact that not everybody has the luxury even Mm -hmm. that every child has um, a laptop or an iPhone or an iPad to be doing that work. So from a work perspective, now we've doubled down on the stress load that that's put on people who are caregiving, people who are parents, um, you know, workers maybe feeling like, ugh, you know, I know so-and-so keeps juggling stuff. Why do they keep getting interrupted? But yeah, to your point, I hope, my hope is that, and I've seen signs of it, that it's made us more empathetic. My fear is that we're going to very quickly go back to normal yeah. and forget how hard it was on so many people. Well, that that leads me to uh, wonder, you know, you mentioned 100 keynotes a year on the road. Do you see yourself going back to that kind of intense schedule? No. Hmm. <laughs> good for you good for you it's it's, no. it's really been eye-opening um to to see this i mean i'm a speaker myself um not to the extent of 100 uh, keynotes a year but I, once you've figured out how to have an alternative and and how to be how to spend more time with the people in your life that matter to you and i think that's what we all eventually want to do um it, it it's hard to picture life the way it was before Mm-hmm. And I was, I, I know that sounds like a lot and it was a lot uh, for sure. And I did say no, there were definitely non-negotiables for me where for I sure. had, you know, family things blocked off or, or kids tournaments or things like that. Um, but as we move forward, there clearly have been companies and organizations and teams that have shown how effectively you can run virtual or hybrid meetings And so I think it's going, I'm hoping that there's going to be a balance. I think one of the things, I don't know if it was Corn Ferry or Gallup, that showed that particularly within the IT space, when they offer a virtual or a hybrid meeting, the attendance by women goes up by 30, almost 35%. Wow. That is huge. That's an access. That's an access opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that might be an access barrier that they didn't realize was even happening. Right. So I think what's what I've also been able to see in that and, and part of what I really like with virtual events is that it, it, it does equalize things in that when you do Q&A, when, when you're doing a question and answer period, people who would have never raised their hands in front of 250 of their teammates or 750 people, right. 100% will ask a question in the chat. That's and I love that. That's great. I love that. That is great. Well, so, speaking of raising your hand for questions, we do have uh, Lily who wants to come up to the microphone. We're speaking with Carrie Lorenz, who is the author of Span of Control, a latest book. Uh, she is also the author of uh, another book, came out uh, just a couple of years ago, called Fearless Leadership, High Performance Lessons from the Flight Deck. Uh, Lily, I don't know if you are still on. You had raised your hand a while ago. And, uh, you know, we catch people in, in various states of uh, of preparedness here, whether they are uh, in the car or uh, in between meetings or whatnot. So it doesn't always work out. So um, if you have a question 
for Carrie, feel free to request access to the microphone, and we will have you up here. So, Carrie, one of the things you talk about uh, in your book is uh, risk. I mean, obviously, as a, a Navy fighter pilot, you are inherently uh, engaging in risky activities uh, every single time you get into that cockpit. And you say risk is unavoidable when you're pushing the performance envelope. What does that mean, and, and, and how can we embrace that mantra with respect to uh, our lives, whether it's personal lives or business lives? So that's a great that's a great question, and part of it is all wrapped into uh, how are we going to make decisions? Are we going to have a bias for action? And one of the one of the things that I in, in my work over the last twenty years helping companies do strategic planning and account planning, and even watching over the last fourteen months or so, what too often people don't do is from a learning perspective or a process perspective, take the time to think, you know, to analyze, to debrief and go, okay, what's working and what's not and why? And this isn't about blame. This isn't about trying to point the finger at anybody. It is about focusing on not who's right, but what is right. And part of risk management is then going to go back to, how are you how are you making decisions how are you assessing information and are you even taking a second to ask what if uh, too often uh, you know we can all think about it in our personal lives or our professional lives of somebody at a table or in a conversation that will say well what if this happens and right away everyone's like oh no 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 we can't talk about that that would be that would be catastrophic well I can promise you in our world we what if things to death. We want to think about everything that can go wrong so that we're aware of it and we've thought about if that happens, what will we do next? So that once we take off, once we once we launch, maybe it's just a routine flight. Just just go out, spin around in the area, we're checking out the airplane and we're gonna come back and land. We want to think about the worst case scenario so that when it happens. We've already thought about it. We know how we're going to respond, which then buys us time. So mm. when, you know, when we think about right now, even risks in, in the business environment, two of the biggest risks right now are going to be continued disruption to your business or a business model and your team or your organization's resistance to change because we all have change fatigue. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> part of all of part of the managing the risk and, and being a high performer isn't that you just go full throttle all the time and and you know this big arrogant overconfident you know Yahoo, but it's being thoughtful, it's thinking about it beforehand so that when you become overwhelmed, when you become overloaded, it'll give you that margin and that space back. You may not make a perfect decision. Hopefully you'll be able to make a better decision that allows you to keep taking action. I love that. And, you know, it's interesting because in my time uh, in the corporate world with Ford Motor Company, we all had to come to uh, our meetings every week with our plan. And and we, we had the business plan review where we reviewed our plans and we were constantly improving them. Everyone was sent back asking to provide the better plan. And it was always about situational awareness and constant tweaks to, you know, still staying true to uh, where Mm -hmm. you're going, but it's how do you make those adjustments along the way? I'm sure that's exactly what you saw from inside the cockpit as well. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, I think even now when we think about, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, having a five to 10 year plan was something that, oh, you need to have a five to 10 year plan. (laughs) Yeah. <clears throat> Good luck with that right now. Yeah. But but the, you can't if you're not planning right now, you're you're missing out on a couple of things for sure. And that I'm sure even in your time at, at Ford and be, being able to bring plans to the table, it's actually in the planning process 
that's as important as the outcome or as the product. Because when you're planning, if it's not in a vacuum, or once you have to bring the plan forward, it allows people to take a look at it. You can maybe before you launch a product or before you take that next step, then you can figure out before you've started taking action, maybe something that's not going to work. And even as importantly, in that plan, or when you think about you bringing all those plans back to the big conference room in, in, in the Ford Innovation Center, let's call it, that somebody can see what the discussion was about and they can see why there was pushback, even if it was about their own plan, so that when the decision was made moving forward, they can say, okay, I know they're not just ignoring this. They chose to go this direction because of X, Y, and Z. And why that's actually so critical is that that builds buy-in. Hmm. What happens when you have buy-in? Then you have more people on board and and headed in the right direction instead of people silently showing up, but with their arms crossed and not actually engaged. And what happens when that happens? Well, then everybody starts not operating as at a performance level that they could, Mm -hmm. which means people are going to start becoming more task overloaded, more task saturated, more disengaged, and it can all lead to burnout. So it's, It's not a a direct A to B thread. If you don't plan, you're going to become burned out. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, it's almost predictable because you've not set yourself or your team up for success. And it doesn't have to take a long time, right? It can be a super short checklist. It can be a a 12-page checklist. But it's just the activity of doing it that then builds in resiliency and gives people, empowers people to adapt because they know what success is supposed to look like. Yeah. And that's key. That's fantastic. Well, uh, keeping on the theme of uh, the parallel between business and military, uh, we've got Dave up here on the stage. Dave would like to uh, talk to you about something related to that. Dave, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thanks, Scott, for bringing me up on stage. And, and uh, thanks, Carrie. I'm really enjoying hearing you speak. And I am a uh, probably the opposite of uh, a military background, Uh, but I've always been fascinated by how the military is able to uh, function and accomplish what they're able to function. And my my question to you is, what do you see as the most successful practices that uh, are able to be brought from military into entrepreneurship because you, you, when you're in the military and you're, you're achieving these monumental tasks with these massive groups of people, what, what is it that, that you see that are, that can be taken from that, gleaned from that and applied to achieving a large, big picture, green sky goal in business? So welcome, Dave. And that is, that's a fantastic question and I'll try to keep it short in case you have, you know, another follow-up question. I think what's fascinating, and the military does not get it right all the time, okay? So please don't, I don't want anybody listening to this thinking I'm coming from a position that the military is perfect, everything's squared away, every leader is awesome, go you, right? Because it's simply not the case. But one of the things that I have found when you look at different teams and even different functional areas or different certain squadrons or certain special ops units or logistics units or supply divisions or tank divisions, whatever the case may be, is that the closest leader to to that group that is being led, I'm not going to say managed, are the ones who are able to articulate very clearly and in an inspirational manner what the purpose is. And when you have Uh, at scale, and whether that's five people, 50 people, or 5,000 people who understand what the purpose is, and you get all of those arrows kind of headed in the same direction, purpose always needs to be your anchor. And it also ends up being the filter that then, then allows your people to understand what is the most important work they should be doing and what should they be saying no to. And when you, when you understand what the purpose is, 
And this isn't just I've sent an email out once or I've told them two times they should know it because that's not nearly enough times to communicate that purpose and those values. When you, when you support that with a great foundation of an execution process, and I'm just going to assume you have the right people on board, then that's where the magic starts to happen because you can have the grandest vision ever, but if you can't execute effectively, if you don't have processes a straightforward, simple process in place that allows you to identify opportunities and learn faster than the marketplace is changing in a really unpredictable environment, then you're never going to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. So the teams that are able to set their ego aside and be aligned, right? That we're not looking for perfect alignment because that one little stray arrow going off target could be, that could be your innovator, if you will. But everybody headed in the same direction. When you have that straightforward process and then people have the right mental model to make good decisions, that's where you end up hitting high performance. So as an entrepreneur, if you don't have that clear vision and then a process that lets people learn, then you're going to be performance limited, whether you're looking to scale, grow, or just get a product out to the marketplace in a really small niche. Um, That purpose, that focus, that discipline is really what allows you to go further faster than anybody else. Mm. Carrie, that that is uh, fantastic. Dave, uh, thank you for that question. Did did you have anything else uh, you wanted to add? No, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, there's a dichotomy between hiring. I, I just left a business where it was, um, we hired unskilled labor and trained them to do a job. And, you know, it, it's very challenging, um, to, to deal with staff on that level. Um, and, and I, that's something that's fairly universal. Uh, but I, I've always admired companies like say a Starbucks where you've got these people that would fall into the category of unskilled labor, but they, they do it consistently, whether you're in Seattle or New York or Toronto, mm-hmm. you get the same latte, right? It's, it's the same consistent system, which speaks exactly to what you're saying. So yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your input. Absolutely. Well, and Dave, Dave, just real quick, a part of that is going to be that I, I would share that that's also a leadership at every level uh, win because, you know, I'm sure there are going to be a few people listening going, well, that's not the experience I had at XYZ Starbucks in Umpty Frat State. But it's it's being able to tie at the field level. And, and that means there has to be clear, inspiring communication from the top down every level and across every functional area within an organization. I'll give you a quick example. I did some work probably a decade ago uh, overseas, and I had a manager of a very, very high-end, oh, I can't even think what they call it now. They make porcelain fixtures. So essentially toilets and sinks. And he came up to me, and we were talking about operational excellence and performance, and he said, well, I just don't see how this can apply to me you know, this, I don't, I don't believe that that can influence our people. And we ended up having a a conversation and this was a European manufacturer and they had ended up having some quality issues where they had toilets that were cracking. And these aren't like run of the mill, $75 install throw wax ring on toilet. These are like, these are bougie. So we end up having this conversation and it turns out that they had changed a ventilation system and the way the facilities managers the people who were cleaning and sweeping the floors at night never changed anything. And it was sucking all the different dust and particulate up into the system that went back into the porcelain that then was causing cracked toilets. Hmm. Well, you then from a leadership perspective have to be able to have the conversation that the person who is on the night shift, let's just call it the night shift in this situation who is sweeping the the manufacturing floors from midnight until 5.30 a.m., realizes why they are such a valuable part of the team. If you don't have that conversation, if people don't feel valued, it's not a fluffy thing. It's It's a culture problem, and it's going to end up being a competitive problem because people will go where they feel valued. And each and every one of us has the opportunity to be the catalyst as a leader to make those people feel valued. And I don't care if you're making 
six figures or seven figures, or you're a tip to wage earner at 285 an hour, you need to make people understand why they are valuable. Mm. I I don't know. That's me on a soapbox because it drives me nuts. No, I've done a ton of minimum wage jobs. That's, and there are people I would work for again and people who I don't care if they paid me seven figures, I probably wouldn't work for yeah, again. Yeah, that's, that's just it. And you feel it on in the front line. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can go to any Starbucks and get the same latte, but how you get treated while you're there, you know, mm-hmm. whether the barista is smiling from behind the counter, uh, whether they get your name right on the cup, uh, and those are all indicators as to how they're being treated by their management. You know, it, it makes me remember that apocryphal story about, John F. Kennedy visiting uh, a NASA facility. And this is back when the space mm-hmm. race was on. Talk mm-hmm. about competitiveness. Um, you know, the, the U.S. was trying to be first to, uh, to space or first to the moon. And uh, he stopped and uh, asked a janitor what he did there. And the janitor said, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. And you mm-hmm. go, wow, that's, that's how you know there's shared purpose and there's a vision that comes right down uh, to that janitorial level, not necessarily the rocket scientist. Right, right. So. And, and again, when people know they're valued, it's, it is actually one of the things, especially during times of overwork or long hours or feeling like you're being asked to burn the candle at both ends, when you feel valued, particularly during times of crisis, it's the energy that that allows you to keep going, allows you to work through the change and the uncertainty and the complexity. And going back to Dave and and everyone who's listening, that is a leadership problem mm. yeah. or opportunity. There right? you go. <laughs> yep. Always or opportunity. opportunity. De- yep. Depending on which way you go, depending on how you lead, it is one hundred percent either going to be, you know, during a time of crisis, either a problem or an opportunity and how you choose to lead through that will profoundly impact your teammates abilities to cope with stress, to deal with it. And even maybe your relevancy in the marketplace going forward. Yeah. Now, Carrie, one of the things you mentioned in span of control is this notion of task saturation. It's something you uh, certainly experienced in the cockpit, but I think it's something we can all relate to today. Having so many things on our plate, uh, being being so overwhelmed and so busy that it, it creates a kind of an, a, a, a paralysis in us. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about task saturation and what we can do to begin to refocus? Absolutely. So we've, we've all, everybody listening now, you've all experienced frustration and stress and maybe even that overwhelming feeling of nauseousness or pit in the stomach that comes at that point in time when you realize there are way too many things pulling on you to handle right now. And task overload uh, or task saturation is, is what happens when essentially the number of things that you're asked to pay attention to outpaces your brain's ability or capacity to manage all of those things. So generally speaking, from a science perspective, it comes in two different forms. It's either technical skill overload, which is when your brain is devolves to focusing on a single thing to attempt to stabilize the situation, or it can happen because of information overload, where uh, it's called too much data syndrome, where the sheer mass and number of inputs can overwhelm your brain's ability to even comprehend or sort through that information. And this is where the idea of even multitasking, where people think, oh, women are better multitaskers. There's there's actually no such thing as multitasking. It's called task switching. And when you do that, when you're task switching or you become task saturated or task overloaded, it's the number one thing that's going to stop your ability to function or execute effectively. So the good news is that when you understand how you are responding and even specifically you understand how to identify when it's happening to other people is then you can start taking action on on reducing it, understanding you're becoming overloaded and learning to manage that with different coping coping mechanisms um, and even some some tips and techniques as well. So obviously at the outset, we want to prevent it. 
so that we don't have to do as much mitigation work. And the preventing it part is is really kind of at the heart of the span of control framework. It's taking some time to be reflective. And again, this doesn't have to be a day-long process, but understanding actually what your priority is so that you're not getting pulled in a thousand different directions. Quick pro tip, the executives that I coach for the first 30 days, I always tell them before you turn on any electronic device or equipment in the morning, grab a stack of post-it notes and a fat Sharpie marker and write down your top three things that if you focus on today will be the most value adding things. So this is not do your laundry, go to the grocery store, but just the three biggest things and then put it where you can see it on the back of your phone, on your desktop, your laptop, your dashboard. And by about day, usually for people, it's between day nine and 12. It fundamentally changes the way they respond to task overload And they become much more intentional on how they spend their time, which then the trickle down effect to that is it's empowering other people to do the same thing as well. So this goes back to us being very clear and intentional. This isn't, and this isn't being inflexible. It's being mindful about identifying those top priorities for you so that you don't become overwhelmed so that you don't fall prey to, um, you know, shutting down or channelizing or simply tapping out because you can't manage anymore. That is so great. That's it's a simple process that we can all do every day. And I I love the rule of three, Carrie. Um, Mm -hmm. It's something that psychologically it works. Uh, We can all remember it and, and simply uh, accomplishing three things in one day seems like a no brainer, but without writing it down and without getting that focus first thing in the, in the morning. Um, it, it's really difficult. And I'm, I'm a huge proponent of no electronics first thing in the morning. It's just, it, which it, is, Oh, it's hard. It is. Especially, I know I love, I'm, I am guilty as charged. I love quick <laughs> scrolling again, back to the Instagram stories or like, Oh, well, the weather, let's see what's happening on Twitter. Right. So I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. But if you just take that two, three minutes to go, okay, the fallouts fails. Remember, this is what's important. This is what's important. Then maybe it'll start chipping into that time that you're doing busy work or that you're spending firefighting and being reactive because you are intentionally focusing on the most important things for you. Mm. And it's a gentle, it's a gentle shift over. Again, it's not all of a sudden the bells are ringing and woohoo, my life is squared away and everything's easy. Look at me. Namaste. Right. Um, but it is what all high performers do. Yeah. You will not find a high performer, not just a lucky one and done, but somebody who's been able to be a high performer over time. They will all have a shared way of doing that because if you dilute your focus, you dilute your power. I love that. I love that. I have one final question for you because we're bumping up at the top of the hour here. Um, before I ask that, if you would like to learn more about Carrie Lorenz and her fantastic work, just go to CarrieLorenz.com and you can find Span of Control wherever major books are sold. Amazon, uh, right through CarrieLorenz.com, Barnes & Noble, wherever you like. So, Carrie, final question for you. Is Top Gun realistic? Mm, the majority of it, it is. I've probably watched that movie 67 times. I can tell you like the 24 uh, continuity things that are, are a little bit off. Um, but but a lot of it actually, uh, it is. I mean, it's che- there are parts of it that are a little, are a little cheesy. I'd, I'd submit to you probably one of the best top 10 soundtracks. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But but there there are definitely parts of it that that definitely are, and the depth of the friendships, the depth of the fear that peace people also experience, yeah, they got that right. That's awesome, Goose or Maverick? Oh, Maverick, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, Carrie Lorenz, thank you so much for joining us on Timeless Leadership. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me today. With so much to worry about, it should be a great relief to know that we can't control everything. With the ability to focus on what is within our power, our span of control, we can free ourselves to be the best leaders we can be for others. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership. Whenever, 
and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, may you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you are a leader. <laughs>